we want to welcome you into this time of sharing the word of God with you. We want you to know that we realize that this is a very critical time for not only us in Franklin County or in Georgia or even in the United States. This is a global attack the world seems to be under. I've heard all of my life that there will come a time when you will not be able to come together publicly and have worship services. Oftentimes we've thought about that as being a situation where a government will, will close it down because of religion and or maybe even war or whatever. We never did really realize it would be pestilence or disease or namely the coronavirus. My heart goes out to you. I miss so very much coming together as a church family, being able to share the gospel of hope and truth and peace to all of you. But our prayers are with you and for you that God will strengthen you and enable you in this time of need. I know that God is a very present help in the time of trouble. And he tells us in his word, call on me and I'll answer you and I'll show you great things and mighty things that you are not aware of. I want to share some scripture with you this morning and just give you a message of hope that you know that God is in control of every situation. But first, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you today in the name of Jesus, we're so thankful for your promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you, but I'll go with you all the way, even to the very end of the age. Having said that, Lord, I know that you are with us right now. With all the uncertainties that's going on, so many people unemployed, so many people sick, so many people filled with anxiety and fear, so many people are facing these troubles and these fears and anxieties alone. We're having to hunker down and just remain where we are in our private abode, not hearing from anyone or anything, but at least we can hear from you. And I'm asking you in the name of Jesus, wherever this message goes out to, that you'll reach out to that individual and give them strength and hope in their time of need. In Jesus' name, we pray for your blessings today. That you'll encourage, give us the anointing to encourage someone and the words that we speak. And we pray. Amen. We'll read you a verse of scripture that's a very common verse of scripture that we hear so much these days in the Christian faith. It's on, it's on uh, car signs. It's on T-shirts. Everywhere you go, it's a word of encouragement. It's found in Jeremiah chapter 29. But I will read verses 10 through 13, and it says, For thus saith the Lord, that after seven years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all of your heart. You know, some things in life just takes us by surprise. And I, as I read that, this verse of scripture, or these verses of scripture several times in the last few weeks, knowing that God has everything under control and that there's nothing that surprises God, that's kind of been my reminder to God, God, nothing can surprise you. You saw this coming before we realized it, whatever being a being in our lives, it would cause us all to realize just how futile and hopeless we really are when something of this magnitude not only just hits us, but hits the globe. It's a reminder that if we can fall short of being able to come up with a cure immediately with a disease, how much greater impact is this world going to suffer when the Antichrist comes on the scene with the magnitude, the ability, and the power to use not only disease, but to use weapons of war and to use people to humiliate and to basically just bring and wreak havoc. I can't help but think that this is part of the things that Paul was talking about when he said, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Times that will be difficult to deal with. Situations that we will have to face. Burdens that we will have to get up under and bear because the cross is going to be heavier than usual. In my lifetime, and in five decades, nearly of ministry, I've never seen anything that will attack the world, attack the church, and attack even us as individuals. Everybody under under this God's green earth is, is under attack. We all are being impacted and affected by this situation. For several weeks before there was even a hint that the coronavirus was going to strike our globe and bring fatalities and sicknesses and even lockdown to the entire world. I preached a series of some messages in, from 
from Psalms 91, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's where we need to be right now. At a time when it seems like despair has hit us all, hopelessness is, seems to be something that, that we're losing, it's a time for us to run back to God. I may mention in that series that God knows what to do to drive the church, to drive the believer, to drive the Christian back to the prayer closet and once again cry out to him. Psalmist David is crying out in this particular text in Psalms 91 and he's telling us that God will protect us from the pestilences and from the, the, the diverse attacks that Satan will send in our life. Bottom line is, some things in this life just surprise us. Stuff that we didn't plan on. Stuff that we actually never dreamed could happen to us. Stuff that we don't like, losing our job. Sickness comes to all of us. Accidents that impairs our lives, causing difficulty. And the thing about that is that you can either get bitter or you can find a way in your life through hope and faith and trust in God that God will bring you through the situation. Sometimes we even lose people that are really close to us and we wonder how in the world can I go on. I have many times in my ministry dealt with situations where death took a loved one, took a partner, took a spouse, and only to hear that partner after they had been together so many years say, I can't make it without you. How can I go on? There was so much that we had yet left to do. Now you are gone. And it seems like a few in a hopeless situation. Sometimes you deal with disappointment. Sometimes we deal with stuff that those moments that are coming into our lives, we just don't enjoy. We don't have an answer. Sometimes we know that God is there, but we don't even know how to cry out to him. And we don't know how to ask him for favor and hope to bring us through. No one enjoys it when their plans fail. No one enjoys it when we have to put our nose to the grinding stone and we have to face life like a plan and just go on and endure the hardships that either God is allowing or Satan is sending or just happens to us in life because that's just the way life is. But nothing in our lives that come upon us ever takes God by surprise. The good news is, regardless of the circumstance, God already knows our destination, according to the scripture that I just read to you. He knows the thoughts, He knows the things, the plans that He has for us. You can't surprise God. And the reason for that is because of His, his attributes. One of those, He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Another one, He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. We serve as Christians, as believers, an all-knowing all-seeing, all-powerful God. God has already seen in the, into the future. He's already looked into your future. He's already looked into my future. He's already realized what lies ahead. And those stumbling blocks that Satan is sending or that people are sending or just life is sending in general, those things that are coming into our lives, if it's more than we can bear, God is faithful and he will not suffer us to be tempted about that that we are able but he will, with the same temptation, make a way of escape that we can bear it. God is always working out things for our good, not just for now, but in our future. Oftentimes we pray for things that's going to eradicate the future that God has already mapped out for us, which is his purpose and destiny for each and every one of our individual lives. And oftentimes our prayer does not get answered because it will hinder the destiny that God is planning for us. But God always goes before us. He always makes the rough path smooth. He always sees what is beyond us, what's greater than us, what's more powerful than us, what's more life-threatening to us. And he always moves ahead with clarity, letting us know that he knows the way through the wilderness and all that we have to do is follow. When Joshua was called upon by God himself to take the place of Moses, he said to him, Moses, my servant is dead. Now I want you, I've chosen you, Joshua, to go before and to lead my people into, into the Canaan land, into the promised land. And Joshua made a statement to God. God, if you do not go with me, I do not want to go at all. And I think that's one of the greatest things. Even though we may be surprised by the circumstance of a disease called the coronavirus, COVID-19. Even though doctors are struggling. In this day of modern technology, when we're living in a, a cyber second moment when you can get an answer to a third world country in just moments, in just seconds, we're baffled by this thing that's causing us to stumble and even struggle. 
Well, my prayer has been every day that God will give a cure, that God will give someone an idea, an experiment, something that will work to bring about the cure, the ultimate healer, and the ultimate answer is Jesus Christ. Regardless of what we face, regardless of what we're going through, if you don't have Jesus, you have nothing at all. You have no hope. Joshua realized this. He realized that leading two million people into a land that he had never really been into before other than just spy out for 40 days. And it was enticing enough for him to believe in God. To know if God says we can have it, regardless of the obstacles, we can have that land. That's all he knew about Canaan. He knew his forefathers started out there. But as far as settling there and knowing every single thing about the territory, he did not. And so he made the acclamation to God or the declaration to God, if you don't go, neither will I. And as we face the days that lie ahead of us, and as I read and heard the news this morning, said that this week alone will be the greatest and saddest week that we will face during this outbreak of the coronavirus. I don't want to face anything without God being in my life. And I certainly don't want to face anything that God hasn't already conquered. Here's the good news. There's nothing that Satan has in his arsenal that Jesus Christ did not defeat when he went to the cross of Calvary. When he went to the Pilate's hall and atheist hands tied him to Pilate's whipping post and atheist, atheist hands beat him to a bloody pulp, Jesus actually took on every weapon, every disease, every attack, everything that Satan has in his arsenal, Jesus took it on and he willingly, like a dumb lamb who opened up his mouth at the slaughter, Jesus took on every peril, every sickness, every disease, every attack, every false accusation, everything that Satan has and all the ability that Satan has to come against us, Jesus faced it. He shed his blood for it and he conquered it when he raised himself from the dead on Easter morning 2000 years ago. Hallelujah and praise the name of the Lord. God said, I know the plans that I have for you. And there's no government, there's no politics, there's no policy that can stop God from being who he is. He's not a Republican, he's not a Democrat, he's not an independent party, he's not an atheist. He is in fact God. And God really has, he really, really honestly and truly has a plan for your life and a plan for my life. The Bible tells us in Philippians that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God. Corona is a name. The coronavirus is a name and it has to bow to the name of Jesus. But we need to understand something. We have to walk with God in order for God to unlock his plans in our life. I can't just read Jeremiah 29 11, so praise God, God's got a plan for my life. But before that plan actually becomes mine, before I put that plan, or before God has the ability to put that plan into my life and your life, I have to follow God. I have to get in alignment with God. I have to walk with God. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, and God took him. Now that was in a time when God had just previously, or he was about to say, he even repented that he made man. At a time when the world, the thoughts were evil, only evil continued. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, Enoch had the ability, he had the stamina, he had the intestinal fortitude, he had the personal compassion and love for God that he chose, regardless of what the world is doing, regardless of what's going on in the world, I'm going to stay with God. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to live for him. I'm going to love him. There is a plan of God for your life. Nothing takes God by surprise. If you're alive, God has a plan for you. If you woke up this morning and, and you're still facing the challenges in your individual life, in your family's life, that's a good thing because God has a plan for your life. He's not finished with you yet. It's not over until you win. But God can't unlock his plan in your life until you choose him, until you accept him, until you obey him, until you serve him. He will find you wherever you are. You may live alone. You may be facing the most horrible moments, the most terrifying moments of your life with this disease and with all that's going on in the world today, being shut in, not being able to move, go out as a senior citizen and 
and get the things that are necessary just for your everyday life. You may be one of those individuals, but God can find you wherever you may be, and he can come to you and comfort you. You know, I love to think about God's grace. God's grace can put you back into the will of God. If you've missed him, if you've failed him, and maybe this, like all the other times in past history when wars drove people back to church, when crises put people back in church, when tremendous diseases put people back in church, it was God's grace that accepted them back and loved them. Psalms 139 says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet, and in your book they were all written, the day's faction for me, but as yet they were none of them. Now that means this, before I was even born, before you were even born, God saw your life and he saw your future. He said to Jeremiah, when he called him to preach the gospel, he says, well, while you were nothing more but a seed in your mother's womb, I saw you and I called you and I ordained you to be a minister and to be a prophet of my word. God's got a book. It's called the book of life. That's what he's talking about in Psalms 139. He saw my former days. Before I was even created in my mother's being, before God ever allowed me to be nothing more but just a sperm or an egg inside of my mother's womb, the book of life was designed for me and for you. And God keeps that book on all of us, every single one of us. When I began to be formed in my mother's womb, when my mother was carrying me inside of her, God wrote my name down in the book of life. He wrote down his plans for me before I was even born. Before I breathed my first breath outside of my mother's womb, before I ever took my first breath of air, before I ever cried out, before I ever took mother's milk, God had already written down my destiny in the book of life. And it is yours. You have a destiny that God planned for you. And he sees. He's watching every movement that we make. He said, he saw me in my innermost beings. Before you were ever born, it's amazing to me that God wrote down the days that he had fashioned just for you. Have I always gone by that book? No. I failed God. You failed God. We will all fail God. If you mess up that plan and don't follow God, God is not going to kick you out. God's not going to become so peeved and grieved at you that he goes, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. All you have to do, and all I have to do, is realign myself with the Word of God. All I have to do is say, God, forgive me. Come back into my heart. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. When I realign my life with God's plans for my life, He restores me. He renews me. He puts me back into His family. Get back into God's plan is all we have to do. Just go back to God. He says, if you will draw nigh unto me, I will draw nigh unto you in James. And you can get right back on track with the plan that God has for your life. Have I told you yet that God has a plan for you and that nothing surprises God? There's a season of preparation that's assigned to all of us when we're coming to our destination. A season of preparation. Man, you know, don't you just hate those times? Don't you just hate prepping for a big test or getting ready for this challenge or going in for an interview or meeting this big conglomerate company that you want to sell product to and you want to make sure you say the right things and you do all the re you do all the research that you can on the company knowing what they do and what you can give to them or sell to them that will make them better, that will improve the integrity and the culture of, of not only their company but everybody they do business with. Those are challenges. But before we can go in and ever hope to win that, that challenge, we've got to prepare ourselves. We've got to do research. We've got to know what we need to know in order to face the challenge that we're facing. And God will put all of us in training. He's training me. He's training you. If you're still on this planet and you're still alive, and if you're listening to this message right now, God is training you. God is prepping you. God always has a plan. Even when we are hopeless, even when we're clueless, even when we don't know who to turn to, what to do, and when it needs to be done, God always has a plan for your life. God is going to use everything in your life to bring Him honor and glory. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not where, where I pastor. It's not what I do in my secular life. It's not where I live. It's not 
the type of car I drive. It's about you and I doing something that will bring honor and glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And even though this may not be pleasant to hear, God will even use brokenness. He will use sadness. He will use disappointment. He will use whatever is necessary to bring us into that place of deliverance where we will look up and acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior of our life. God always orders preparation that gives opportunity for our lives to advance and accomplishing what God wants us to accomplish for our life. You've got to go through the training. Every one of us have got to submit to the will of God. Even the Son of God, as we are approaching Easter coming up, Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane and he tried to bargain with his own father. He says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, in just our colloquialism, it means, Lord, have we examined this closely? Is there another way? Do I really have to die? Do I really have to give up my life so that everybody else in this world, wrong or right, can have life and have it more abundantly? Do I have to suffer? Will I have to be falsely accused? Have I really got to go through all of this just to redeem fallen man and reconcile him back to you? God, is all of this really necessary? Even Jesus had to go through the training. Even Jesus had to yield his life to the will of his Father God before all of us could be redeemed and reconciled back to God. But because he did, we stand justified today by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. God is trying to prepare us, I believe, when the coronavirus is over because so many poor people that normally have not acknowledged God as their source, I believe that this world is going to see a revival. I believe God is going to revisit us again. I believe we're going to see a mighty outpouring in these last days because of the coronavirus. I don't believe God sent it. I believe that God knew it was coming. I believe this is all, as it always has been, the work of the thief who comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. But I believe that God can, have, God can get involved in this, and he can do what he always, always has done. When Joseph's brothers came down into Egypt, and after Joseph's father had died, they were fearful that Joseph would take vengeance over them now that his father was gone. And they came to him, and they wanted to remind him of the promise he made to the father for the family to be reminded, re re reunited. And Joseph simply said to his brothers, what you did, you did for evil. But God took what you meant for evil, and he made good out of it on my behalf. I tell you, whatever Satan is sending in your life, God is faithful. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. But he'll go with us all the way, even to the end of the world. In this verse of scripture, in Jeremiah 29 and 11, the word, the word of God here gives us two things that I want to share with you in closing. First of all, he gives us hope about our future. He plans to prosper you. He plans to bless you. He plans to give you hope. Bible said he sends angels into our life to walk with us. In Lamentations 3 and 21, he says, Then this I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. Jeremiah was saying, When I remember what God told me, when I remember the word of God and how precious it is to me when God spoke it to me in a time of need, he says, When I reflect on God's word and what he promised me, it always gives me hope. So we are not without a hope. Lamentations 3 and 2 says, Though the Lord's mercies are through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Coronavirus may be raging and it may be presenting its threat on the world today. But the Bible says, or Jeremiah said in the book of Lamentations, I will not be consumed by the onslaught of the devil. I will not be totally consumed. I will not just absolutely be in fearful and fear and trepidation because of what might happen. My trust is in the Lord. In Lamentations 3, 22 through 24, it says, His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. In Lamentations 24, The Lord is my portion, therefore I will hope in Him. God has a plan for your life. That's the second point. We have hope, and God has a plan. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to have, not going to have setbacks. Every single one of us, if we're living, if we're breathing, if we're moving, if we're, if we're moving forward, 
We're going to face disappointments. We're going to have setbacks. But nothing can surprise God. And Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, For we know that all things work together for good for them who love the Lord, who are the call according to his purpose. There's always God's plan at work. Even when I don't know he's working, he's working. Our praise team sings a song sometime leading us in worship. Even when I don't see him, he's moving. Even when I don't feel him, he's working. Even when I don't hear from him, he's moving. He's working, he's moving. And I'll tell you, there's, there's always a plan of God at work in my life. I may not always understand, and I may not always walk it out perfectly in just exactly the way, but as long as I'm doing my best in obedience to God, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. The situation isn't good at the moment, and we always feel that way when we're going through a peril, when we're going through distress, when we're going through a situation that we simply don't have the answer for, and we feel so out of control because we can't fix this ourselves, and we're dependent upon God. He's a very present man from the time of trouble I started this message with this morning. And I will tell you, the situation at this moment may not be good, but God is always there. He's always there. When you wake up in the morning, he's there. When you go to bed at night, he's there. God is going to come through for you. Put your trust in God. You may be worrying yourself sick. You may be struggling about what are we going to do. How am I going to fix it? How am I going to protect my family? Listen to me. I thought about that for my own individual family, for my own individual life, and for those that I love very dearly. I've thought about them, and for those I don't even know, I care about them, and I'm praying for them. But I remember what God said to Moses. He said, I want you to roast a lamb over an open fire. I want you to capture the blood. And on the outside of your house, I want you to make a mark in the blood. Tonight, the death angel is going to pass over all of Egypt. And the firstborn in every house is going to die where the blood has not been applied. And I think about while the children of Israel will hunker down in their little shacks in Goshen, just outside of Egypt, outside of the palace, outside of their flesh, living environment. Outside of that, they were hunkered down and they were trusting God. They could hear the screams. They could even hear the animals hollering and bellowing. They could hear all that. And they were hunkered down, listening to all the screams. But they took God at his word, and they believed that if they obeyed God, that blood would mean to God what he promised it would mean to him. Satan so can't touch you through the bloodline. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going to get coronavirus or we can't get coronavirus. It means that we simply have a promise. As long as I stay in covenant relationship with God, I have a strength, I have a power, I have a hope, and I have a help far beyond anything that this world can give. Bible says, if you will keep my statutes and obey my commandments and keep my word, none of these diseases that I place upon Egypt will I place upon you, for I am the Lord thy God that he with thee. That is the first place in the Bible where his attribute, Jehovah Rapha, is mentioned, the Lord, our healer. I pray for you today. I pray for strength and peace and power and hope in the Holy Spirit that wherever you go, God will be with you, and he'll protect you, and he'll keep you safe in the palm of his hand. Job prayed every day for his children. He realized that even though they may not be offering up the sacrifices they should be offering up for themselves, the Bible says that Job offered them up on their behalf. The Bible also tells us that Jeremiah, whom I have quoted several scriptures from this morning from the scripture, tells us that Jeremiah, even though he was not in Babylonian captivity, God gave him revelation that they would come out. And he knew that the peril that they were facing was greater than many of them could bear. So he prayed that God would build a fire, a wall of protection around about them that will keep them safe. That's my prayer. That's my heart's desire for you today. As we close in prayer, my prayer is that the Lord will build, put you, build a fence, put you inside of a hedge that nothing can get to you and devour you and keep you safe. Let us pray. Father God in heaven. We thank you today for your promises, and every one of them are yes and amen. We're grateful to you for the miracles that we have already been given through this time of need. I pray, Lord, that wherever this message goes, it will bring hope. It will bring 
a life of just expectancy that it's not over yet because God is in control. Wherever you need to go, dear God, I pray that you will go there. For those who are at their least and weakest moments, I pray that you'll strengthen them. You said that your arm isn't short, that you couldn't save. Neither is your ear heavy that you couldn't hear. So I pray blessings upon all of those who hear today this message, that you'll come to them now and bless them through your Holy Spirit and keep them safe in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.